Okay. <clears throat> Welcome back, everybody, for the afternoon session. Um, we will be going, um, we, we, as, as I mentioned in the morning, maybe for some of you that have arrived uh, later in the day, uh, Gunny Harbo uh, is unable to be with us today. So we have slightly rearranged the schedule for the afternoon, and we will be hearing uh, from Peter Mullen and John Oxendorf next, after w which will take us to right around um, 3.30. Uh, that's when we'll take a coffee break uh, till 4 o'clock, and uh, then at 4, 4 o'clock, 4.15, we will regroup for the last presentation of the day by uh, Michel Pierre-Louis. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Peter Mullen, who is uh, an extraordinary figure in New York City preservation, uh, who's been involved in particular in, in reshaping our concept of public space and of the city and of the role of preservation in it through his work uh, at the High Line Foundation. He is the Executive Vice President of Friends of the High Line, uh, as Vice President for Planning and Design from 2004 to 13. Peter was responsible for all aspects of physical development of the High Line, including planning, design, construction, and collaboration with the city of New York. He has also played a central role in the policy and advocacy efforts of the project, leading to community-based efforts to preserve and redevelop the third and final section of the High Line, which just opened recently, and I, uh, two weeks ago, and I encourage all of you, if, if you have a chance, to, to go see it. Uh, an architect by training, Peter is the treasurer of the board of directors of the Architectural League of New York, and was previously a member of the Board of Directors of the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation and a member of the Safe Gansevoort Task Force that successfully created the Gansevoort Market Historic District in 2003. Please join me in welcoming Peter Mullen. Um, can you hear me? Thank you, Jorge, uh, and it's really such a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm quite honored to be a part of this group of speakers, and Jorge, I, I commend you for, for pulling together such, a, in, such an interesting group of speakers, particularly I've uh, enjoyed the international aspect of this, and it's really helping to broaden my own thinking on this subject, so thank you for that. Um, you know, Jorge, against my will, made me uh, and I think he made us all reduce our titles to one word. Um, you know, I fought him hard on it, but he won in the end. But it, it was a good thing, I think, in the end, because it really made me re, rethink this talk and also rethink um, how to think about the High Line um, in a new way, centering on preservation and its role in its development and its ongoing life. Um, just to take a quick show of hands, how many people have been to the High Line? Great. All right. Um, how many people have been there uh, recently? Great. Okay. So I apologize if a lot you've seen some of these images before, but I'm hoping that we can have a discussion about um, some of the Im implications of the project and how we've approached it, um, centering on preservation. Um, so this is one take on the project from very early on, which was, um, I would say, a, a hardline view of preservation. And um, I, I admire this opinion. Um, I don't think it would have brought as much pleasure to as many people um, as hopefully we have. But you know, it does call to a, in a sort of pointed way, you know, what are we trying to do here and what is the role of preservation in creating public space? And, you know, I think the discussion earlier about flexibility is an important one here. Um, and, you know, that, that idea was driven very much by these images. Um, this, we had a photographer, Joel Sternfeld, spent a year on the High Line taking these pictures and they became the kind of the way that people could engage the structure. Nobody had been able to get up there, or very few people had been able to get up on top of the structure to see this. And so these pictures became the representation of the project and were part of what drew people in, and I think what inspired that comment before. Um, 
and I'd like to try to use these pictures as a kind of a way of talking about the project as a whole because they they both inform I think everything that we've done to date um, but in terms of the physical development of the High Line but they also I think in their abstraction um, open the door to us doing what we did in ways in which we may not have been able to otherwise um, and in the sense that you know, they, they mythologized the, the project um, in a way that made it somewhat unreal, okay? I mean, it, you know, it, it initially resembled a ruin more than anything else, and that's what it, how it existed in, in the, the minds of people who became interested in the, in the project. And I think, you know, in New York, we don't have a lot of experience with ruins. Um, you know, when something goes out of use, we tear it down and we rebuild it. So there, there, we don't have a lot of experience with this and, and I think that was one of the reasons why people were interested in the High Line. The idea that there was a ruin in the middle of the city hiding in plain sight. Um, and these pictures were very much like, and, and Joel actually makes this parallel himself, were very much like Bierstadt's paintings of the American West in the 19th century which had one of the results of which was the creation of the National Park Service. For the bulk of the people in this country, including policymakers in Washington who had never been to the American West, these paintings were the way that they understood what was there and helped to inform an idea about how we should think about those spaces. Um, and so then, in that way, myth becomes reality. Um, so again, I, what I think is interesting about these, these pictures is that, and this is where we get into the, the concept of open-endedness, is that they, they suggest uh, a present that is sufficiently abstracted, um, that recalls a, a past that never really existed, um, and I think project a future that is completely undefined in the sense that there was no way that this was going to be the future, and this goes back to that original comment card, like there was no way that the, this could remain a wilderness area. The minute you allow people into it, it would have to change. Um, but I think that the, the abstraction of this image helped people to see the High Line as a kind of open canvas, as something that could be resilient enough to receive multiple stories and both um, you know, actual real stories and then the stories that would be written eventually and so that everybody in their own minds had maybe a different idea about what the High Line could be. And that, that sort of resilient conception of the High Line I think allowed people's kind of a means of entry into supporting the project that it otherwise wouldn't have had. So what I wanted to do try to do pretty quickly is to go through some of the stories of the High Line and which are all true um, but all slightly different and I think to, to demonstrate how a project like this can actually can embrace multiple stories at the same time and that that can also then become the basis of a, of a, a design approach that is intended to receive an ongoing stream of additional stories over time. So the first story is just about is about infrastructure and the remaking of the city. This is the High Line on the west side of Manhattan. Um, the, the, the sort of ancient history of the project dates back to the mid 19th century when um, there began to be uh, at grade rails on, uh, on, at, on street level on the west side. Uh, this is 11th Avenue. And you can see there's this incredible cacophony of, of different forms of transportation and this condition is what led to the creation of the High Line as an elevated railroad structure. Um, this is 10th Avenue, right as the High Line was being completed. Um, that guy on the horseback is the West Side Cowboy who would ride in front of trains to basically wave people out of the way so they didn't get hit by the trains. Um, and again, this is a part of this myth-making process of that the, the, the city is capable of. Um, the idea that, I mean, how many people really were getting hit by trains, really? But to have a guy on horseback mimicking a cowboy all of a sudden elevated that whole experience into something else. Um, and the drawings of Hugh Ferris, the idea of imagining the future of the city as a vertical city as opposed to a horizontal one. Um, and that's the condition that led to the creation of the High Line. This, you know, the High Line as a piece of infrastructure that would 
go through buildings, this intensive integration of buildings and transportation on multiple levels. I mean, it was a very romantic idea from the first half of the 20th century. Um, the, the physicality of the structure, I think, could acquire a certain, and again, this is due to this incredibly beautiful photograph, but uh, this, the, this beautiful materiality, you start to understand when you look at this closely, the craft that was put into making the High Line as well as, as its heft. Um, and then just the sheer fact of this artifact that cuts through the city as a single thing, um, you know, slicing its way through the urban fabric. Um, this is the High Line right as it was completed in 1934. You can see the accurate trains on the street um, uh, still in existence. And this is the High Line in about 2000. After uh, 20 years of disuse, the last train ran on the High Line in 1980, and this landscape, the self zone landscape, came up by itself, and that was the basis of those Sternfeld photographs. Um, and which, you know, I think is a very real kind of miracle in a sense, the idea of demonstrating to people that if you just leave well enough alone that nature can survive in the city and that there is a, the opportunity to reimagine how the city and nature can coexist purely through just being left to be by itself and, you know, then suggesting, well, how can we intervene in that? Sorry, that's me. Um, that story gets then integrated into an urban planning story which is, you know, how does the High Line as this ribbon of public space potentially interact with the surrounding urban fabric? You have an existing residential neighborhood in Chelsea. West Chelsea is a really mixed uh, fabric, very much in transition. You have Hudson Yards to the, to the north, which the Bloomberg administration had significant agendas for in terms of the expansion of, of Midtown. And then at the bottom, Gansvort Market Historic District and the West Village, which are of a very different character. And the High Line is this public space, this ribbon that cuts through the middle of them and connecting all of them, connecting neighborhoods that previously you would never think of as being connected, that becomes an urban planning story that people can start to understand and get behind. Um, and the Bloomberg administration then starts to drive that story themselves, right? So what started as a grassroots romantic vision then becomes a kind of uh, progressive urban planning agenda on the part of the government. Um, and that dovetails with other initiatives that they have. This is the Jet Stadium, which you may remember from 34th Street. Um, but that was part of the agenda, is that there was all this stuff happening on the west side and the High Line was gonna be part of it. Um, and without the Jets, the High Line doesn't happen, right? So you can start to see how the project starts to get woven into all these external forces that are shaping it. And it has to be resilient enough to be able to accept those in order to move forward. Um, the, the, this part of the city was underdeveloped. There were development opportunities, and that was an agenda of the city as well. Um, so there was a rezoning of West Chelsea, where this is the existing fabric, and you can start to see what was proposed in terms of additional density that the High Line could catalyze. Um, the city saw it as an economic boon for the city, that if they invested a certain amount, that they would actually get that money back in terms of additional tax revenue. So now the High Line is a symbol of, of economic, um, economic catalyst, uh, economic generator. Um, they create a very complex rezoning mechanism, uh, which calls for the transfer of development rights, basically from underneath the High Line um, to, uh, to other sites within the neighborhood. Again, so the High Line now is, a, is, a, is a basically a development arm. Um, and then it becomes a simple infrastructure project. It's a bridge project. You've got to basically sandblast the structure. You've got to scrape off the, the existing uh, contaminated soil. You have to rewaterproof the slab. And then you can put back the public space. And this is what's created. And again, it's now it's a new public space cutting its way through the city. And it becomes, it's an urban planning project. So what started as a romantic vision is now been codified into something very different. Um, so, and that's people. Um, the High Line has, been, has become a spine for economic uh, uh, development in this neighborhood. Um, and at one end, you have the Whitney Museum, which, uh, you know, when we started this, would never imagine coming down to the meatpacking district. You know, they came from the Upper East Side. And at the other end, you have the mega development of Hudson Yards, all of which was probably unimaginable when Joel Sternfeld took those first pictures. Um, and this, this kind of sums it up for me in a way in that these are two 
advertisements one which is in the new yorker for uh, an art festival that they were having annually the other one on the right which is a full page ad in the times magazine for the caledonia and in both of them the physical artifact of the structure the steel itself is being used as essentially the signatory this the symbol of everything that the highland represents to this community, to their respective communities. In the terms of the New Yorker, it's, you know, it's a high culture artifact. In terms of the Caledonia, it's basically the reason to move to a new neighborhood. Okay, they don't show their building, they show the high line structure, a drawing of it, so it's an abstraction of it. So you can start to see how the idea of something can be adapted and molded in terms of different contexts. Okay, so that's one story, which is about urban planning and development. The next story, which is seemingly opposed to that, is about community organizing, okay? Um, two guys, Robert Hammond and Joshua David, who didn't know anything about urban planning, who met at a community board meeting and who had both independently been interested in the High Line, decided, well, you know, why don't we try to do something about it? They didn't know what they were going to do. They didn't know how they were going to do it. They just thought, let's, let's start. Um, they were initially referred to as two guys with a logo, Right? That was the basis of their, of their initiative. Um, and they just started talking to people and trying to build a tent of support. Um, they had a villain, right? So the previous mayor, Mayor Giuliani, was in favor of demolition, so he was the bad guy. He can organize a lot of people around a bad guy. Um, they had the development community that was also bad guys because they wanted to tear the High Line down. Um, this is, they did Edison Properties, which was the main property owner in trying to fight the demolition of the high, fight for the demolition of the High Line, um, they waged a, basically a counter propaganda campaign called the High Line Reality Campaign, um, talking about all the reasons why the High Line as a park, right, would not work uh, because it was different and new and unproven. Again, we come back to the images because the images now in this context begin to catalyze a preservation, a grassroots preservation movement in opposition to these other, these villains. Um, you know, and so now you've got public meetings where the, the effort to save the High Line is being discussed and actually this is how I got involved in the project. I was an architect working for a firm recently out of school. I felt pretty much unempowered, uh, you know, totally frustrated because, you know, you come out of school very idealistic and everybody tells you you don't know anything, you can't do anything. Um, but these guys were doing something. And so I started showing up for, at, at, at uh, rallies and getting petitions signed, et cetera, and as a way to actually be useful and try to make a difference. Um, you have a little bit of humor involved. Also, if you want to run a grassroots campaign, red t-shirts. Works every time. Um, again, all that grassroots organizing, you get the elected officials involved, right? So at some point, the elected officials realize, oh, there are actually people who care about this. I better get on board or else I'm going to be left behind, right? Um, and then you start to, to try to, to get people excited in other ways. So this was a, an exhibition that we ran in Grand Central following an ideas competition, an open, free ideas competition that um, was recognized that no, you know, you weren't going to, if you submitted, you weren't going to get your submission built, but you could get it exhibited. And what we found was that there was all this latent interest in the High Line, dating, I think, from Stephen Hall's early projects um, involving the structure. Um, so we had 732 entries from 32 countries. It was, which no one ever expected. Um, and there were crazy ideas. So one was, you know, turn the High Line to a mile and a half long swimming pool. Um, right? <laughs> Should have done that. What were we thinking? Um, or, you know, there were probably, I would say, a tenth of the submissions were roller coaster ideas. Um, uh, I have no idea what this is. Um, but again, this starts to change the way that people think about what the project can be, right? So now maybe it's not just about preserving the structure, maybe it's about this is a project about innovation. Right? Maybe this is a project about redefining public space. How do we think about what we do? And so all of a sudden, those, those counter-propaganda ads that Edison was running about this is not a park, well, that becomes an asset as opposed to a liability. Um, you gotta throw parties, right? That's how you get people, you know, it's a social aspect to this whole process. And so you throw parties, you get people excited. Um, 
and you actually and you engage them. You listen, right? So we had lots and lots and lots of meetings to talk to people. Now, and this is where I think it gets interesting because we basically went to these meetings not promising what we were going to do, but asking people for their ideas, and not promising that we would be able to implement them, but asking. And again, this goes back to the, what I was talking about earlier, is that once people start thinking about things, then they can get their imaginations going, you've hooked them, you've got them engaged, and then they become your supporters. Um, and a lot of the ideas did end up circling back, you know, over time into the process. Um, and that doesn't stop once you've built the structure, right? So one of the things we're doing right now is constantly working on how do we engage our community, particularly the local neighborhood and New Yorkers. Um, you know, so it's all through education and programming, right? This is, a, this is a training for a group of educators who are then gonna work in the public school system to use the High Line basically as a way of teaching about engineering, nature, history of the city, et cetera. Um, we have, we developed a, a basically a play uh, sort of kit of parts, um, which is all about how do you put these sort of like a high line erector set. And we have days when we basically throw all this stuff out onto the lawn and kids come and they can play with it. Um, we have these salsa nights, which were again a community driven idea, which is, you know, we asked, what do you want to do on the high line? I said, wouldn't it be great to have salsa? So, you know, we do it. Um, and we work with the local teens because they are the ones that are going to then communicate the the belonging, that sense of belonging up to the park in their own community. Um, so these are ways in which you again start to tell multiple stories to different constituents and you have to have a public space that is resilient enough to be able to accommodate all of them. And so that's where we get into design. Um, this is the design team on an early site visit looking around, looking lost. Um, not knowing what to do. Our board chair is on the right, you know, the man alone. Um, you know, he's got his own ideas. Um, but, you know, I think, and again, the design team kept coming back to these Sternfeld images because it was so captivating and um, had grabbed people's attention. But the question was, how do you figure, how do you actually take this into the future? Um, so, you know, they spent a lot of time looking at the material qualities, the specific material aspects of the structure itself, the different colors, even in this shot of different parts of the flowers at different times of year, um, the steel, the rails themselves, um, the colors of the grasses. Um, also the character of the place, right? The place had never been able to be occupied, so it had an illicit quality to it. So how do you take that quality into the future? Something that's a little more ephemeral. Um, and so they started with these early images, which were a combination of, you know, through photo montage of old and new fabric, basically grafted onto one another, to use um, a term that was used earlier, uh, to try to create a vision of something new, but carry the past forward with it. Um, you know, I, this is one of my favorite all-time images, which you know, obviously owes to the images by Super Studio in the 60s, but, you know, of the, the, the post-apocalyptic family who has found the High Line as a safe haven. Um, but the idea that the High Line could continue to embrace the neighborhood and the structure's gritty past as it redefined itself in the future. So instead of really focusing on the specificity, specificity of a design, they came up with a system that in a sense would be infinitely flexible and could be deployed in different places along the High Line in different ways depending on the context, which is this system of a sort of digitized green and, and hard and soft uh, combination uh, fabric. Um, and in some ways, it, it was a, taking the, the crack in the pavement um, that has a piece of grass coming up through it and making that the essence of a design concept. Right, so it's inherently subversive, um, but also gets back to essentially some of the essential character that was the basis of those Sternfeld images, um, and that that essentially that fabric could then be replicated over a series of different environments depending on the locations and climatic conditions, etc. Um, and then the idea that this the the what would come from the implementation of that fabric would change over time. So this is a, a diagram showing how different habitat and uh, flora would evolve over a period of time and diversify over time. Um, and that also held true for both human programming and that programming at the beginning would not be the same as what it is five years down the road and that those things could proliferate and that the design need to be able to accommodate this proliferation. 
Um, and they were pretty explicit about it. It's, it's a little bit hidden, but if you look at the billboard on the left, you know, the, the, the billboard says, what will grow here? So again, the same way that the Sturmfeld photographs allowed people to ascribe their own aspirations onto the design team basically took the same strategy and did the same thing. And that both helped people to get on board with the project, but I think also has created a design that also will continue to evolve over time. Um, this is the built project. Uh, you know, I think the, the, the specificity of some of the formal aspects of it are important um, because they, again, they give this place a character that is specific to it. Um, they're all about recalling the linearity of the railroad um, and also that idea of the interface of the hard and the soft. But there's also a, the relationship of the High Line to the city and this kind of superimposition of this new experience onto the city that both allows you to be in the city and apart from it at the same time um, is always part of the experience, right? So in some ways, we're, we're trying to take advantage of the borrowed landscape of the city to, to make the High Line experience what it is and to, to, that's really what the High Line experience is all about. Um, it's always about this contrast between different material elements, whether it's the hardness of the structure and the weight of the structure compared with the softness of the green in this landscape, compared to the newness of, of the new interventions with the old historic fabric. Um, and these things are always kind of superimposed and layered on top of one another, um, even to the point of the graffiti on adjacent buildings. Uh, you can see the, the, you know, the, just the trace of that remaining behind, and that tells a story as well. Um, this is a, a recollection of the billboard. I mean, this is probably the most literal one that we have, but you know, the highlight needs to be covered in billboards, so let's see how we can reinvent that. Even that's historic fabric. So take the form, and then you make the activity that's happening behind it the thing that's being advertised. Um, we're always trying to bring people close to the structure, allow them to touch it and feel it. Um, and again, see the city in a new way in this dialogue between the artifact of the High Line and the city around it. Um, that goes for true at night. Um, again, this is an image that could have been taken before we started. It shows the, the rail with this, this very wild landscape interacting with one another. Um, you know, and the, I think that the, the ephemerality of landscape is also has always informed our approach that we know that the, the landscape itself is changing over time, so we have to change with it. Um, occasionally there are specific moments along the length which require a more specific response. Um, and these require some intervention into the, the physical structure. So is this preservation? I mean, we took out a lot of the structure to do this, but it allows you by framing the structure and framing the views from the structure in a new way, I think, to show you something about the structure that you hadn't seen before. So, you know, the, before we opened, there was this moment when it was finished and then it was empty. And we had spent so much time thinking about the High Line as this empty place. Um, and the, the sort of melancholic solitude of it had been so much part of its character that you, we felt that we were about to lose something, right? That was gonna be lost forever. And then what we found is that, you know, once you add people into it, all of a sudden, the thing takes on a whole other life all to itself. And so this is what I would call the open-endedness of public space, is that people aren't controlled. They're going to do what they want to do as long as you give them the opportunity to do that. And that, I think, is one of the things that we have tried to do, is give people the opportunity to express themselves. Um, and what's great is that they do that. They, they, I mean, if you can think of it, people are doing it on the High Line. I mean, they work, they kiss, they sunbathe, they you know, hang out, it's, you know, it's everything and anything. Um, some of that activity gets curated, so, you know, we try to add a little bit of help along the way to provide some programming to engage people and to bring people together. Um, every year we do these, these sort of family-style soup events on the High Line, and it's, you know, again, you get to sit pe next to people that you don't normally sit next to. Um, we have a, a pretty robust temporary art program, again, as a way of drawing people in, engaging them in new ways, looking for ways to change people's perspective, um, and then looking for temporary installations wherever we can. This was a parking lot next to the High Line 2011 where we installed a, a roller skating rink um, and, uh, and a beer garden. And again, we had the opportunity to do it. It was a way to actually 
do something that we couldn't normally do on the High Line to engage a different constituency in a way that we hadn't been able to before. Um, and then there are things that, you know, just the crazy stuff that people do. I don't, again, don't know what this is, but, you know, for some reason people love to do stuff on the High Line. There's a performative aspect to this place um, that encourages this activity. Um, then there's the activity adjacent to the High Line. So all of a sudden, the High Line is a public space, is a kind of detonator, is starting to actually create activities that, that draw in the, the, the neighborhood as a whole. Um, this, you know, I don't know, how many of you went to these performances in 2009? Anybody? So at the end of the construction period, the, um, we had a light installed on the High Line and it was misaligned into this, this apartment where this woman is singing. And so she said, look, if you're gonna shine a light on me, I'm gonna give you a show. And so she started coming out and giving these cabaret performances. Not particularly good, not particularly good, but they became a kind of local sensation where, you know, all of a sudden people realized, oh, Thursday at nine, she's out on her, on, her, on her fire escape. And so from 20th Street to 19th Street, it was standing room only, basically filled with people waiting for this performance. That again, nobody had planned, nobody had programmed. It was a kind of a, you know, spontaneous reaction on the part of the neighborhood. This is, you know, life imitating theater, imitating life or something. I, you know, so all of a sudden there, there's, you know, this is the unpredictability of creating public space. And I think this is the best representation of, of what was created that allows for this kind of a reaction. So we just finished section three at the rail yards. And so, and we had been open for a while. So there were a lot of questions about, you know, what lessons do we learn from the past that could apply to this new section? And the context is very different. Um, this is the extension of Midtown. These are very, very large buildings. Um, you get a sense of the scale compared with the Empire State Building. I mean, it's, there's, there's this huge density. Um, and we spent a lot of time thinking, do we, you know, how do we compete with that? Do we need to create something taller or bigger or to respond? And we sort of went the other direction, which is to say, you know, how do we make the High Line more High Line, more specific, more integral to itself, almost as a kind of foil to that uh, new development? And focusing on, I think, the material aspects of, of the structure and the design elements. So, you know, this is a kind of evolution of, of the vocabulary that had been established before where we actually allow people to walk on the tracks, which is a kind of sort of highly rusticated experience of, uh, of industrial artifacts within the city, again, which you typically wouldn't find. I give the city a lot of credit for allowing us to do this because, you know, you don't usually allow people to walk on, you know, railroad tracks in public space. Um, and they do it. But it, it was a way of actually, I think, providing, you know, this development, this is, this is globalization and the impact on cities. And I think, you know, the, the role of design of public space is really to be an antidote to that, to that sameness, right? You've got to provide something that is specifically speaks to the culture of the place where you are. Um, and that's where the historic artifact and the authenticity of that artifact play a role. Um, you know, we still try to transform it. We still try to manipulate it. This is a play feature that's made out of um, the high line structure. These are the steel beams that have been coated in rubber um, to create a basically like a sort of a jungle gym using the, the actual uh, high line steel. Um, but we also had the opportunity in this third section to actually bring people back full circle to the original self sown landscape. So. The, the section basically west of 11th Avenue where it, it approaches the river, instead of rehabilitating the entire structure, we just put down a simple path on the, on the, on the existing condition. And we preserved literally, um, like that comment card in a way, uh, the original self sown landscape. And what's, what, you know, I think this initially started as a, as a way to actually finish the project more quickly. It was a strategic implementation measure. But what it has become is a way to tell the entire story of the High Line in a much deeper way. I think people now, when they engage with the new material on the High Line, the things we did to the South, they start to understand where it came from in a different way. There's a richness to that understanding that now is provided by the presence of that original landscape. Um, we've tried to create a language 
of interventions that's simple that try to, you know, again, highlight the existing over the new in this case. Um, you know, there, but there's also, we've done a, there's an installation by Adrian Villarojas, which are these series of cubes, which, you know, in, that are made out of concrete, a mix of concrete and dirt, and that are in a process of decomposition right now, um, which I think start to highlight people's attention uh, to the role of time in these landscapes and the ephemerality of landscape. Um, and again, it's an intervention that reveals something about the history of the site. So this is a quote from the leopard. Um, I, you know, there's a lot of, in my research on this. There's a lot of debate about how to translate the quote, but um, you know, I think the idea is that there's there's the power of transformation to reveal something about the thing that we want to hold on to the most, um, and that's what we've tried to do. So thank you. Thank you. Excellent presentation, fascinating. In the 80s, I worked with some people who were very interested in preserving the High Line for train purposes. And um, what happened to that group, and did they inform anything that you all did? And they were also involved with Ducks Unlimited, which uh, saves um, open space for birding and fowls. And also, did the con in conjunction with that question about the specific group with trains, how about the trails? Was it, is yeah, it called? Trails. Yeah, rails to trails movement. Did that also help yeah. you and inform you? So all of that was important to us. Um, I'll start with rails to trails first because there was a structural impact. Basically, the rails to trails provided the legal foundation for turning the High Line into a public space. And it's, you know, it's essentially a workaround within the, at the federal level to protect railroad networks throughout the country because they're seen as essentially as a as a transportation infrastructure, meaning there was a period of time when they were all getting eroded, right? That net was getting holes in it, and once you get too many holes, the net doesn't work, right? So the, the federal government said, we need to hold on to that net. And so, you know, the whole legal basis of the High Line is that we're preserving it for future rail use, right? That's, that's what we're actually doing from a legal standpoint. So, um, so the, 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 the people that tried to, to um, preserve the highland in the 80s for rail use were very important um, in the most part because then when we came around, there were actually some people out there in the community who had had some experience and some attachment to the High Line. So even though we weren't gonna be doing what they had imagined we would do, and one of those was our local congressman, right, who had wanted to save the High Line for industrial use, they had an attachment, and so they were supportive of the reuse, even though it was different from what they had originally intended. Hi, my question is um, about the air rights. You showed the slide about the transfer of air rights, but yeah. um, throughout the length, well, particularly when there's building opportunity adjacent to the High Line, I'm just wondering what kind of zoning or other controls are in place to preserve yeah that, you know, that light <coughs> corridor or light and air for the people that opens up the vistas, but also obviously for the plants to grow. Right, right. Um, so could you talk about that, please? Yeah, um, there's actually a pretty detailed and complex zoning resolution uh, that governs all of those setbacks around the High Line. Um, you know, just to talk about the zoning thing for a second, because I think it's important, the zoning was coming to this part of the neighborhood with or without the High Line. And then when the High Line got inserted into that process, because you know, this neighborhood was changing, it was happening. Um, when the High Line got inserted in the process, all of a sudden now the zoning had to amend itself to, uh, to like, receive the High Line. And one of the things that it did was create the need for these pockets of air and setbacks that would allow to make, make sure that the High Line was a viable public space long term. Um, so I think one of the, the, sort of the byproducts of it, even though the High Line itself doesn't control the neighborhood, one of the byproducts of that is that the zoning for the surrounding neighborhood did get slightly amended in order to respond to the High Line. And I think it's contributed to preserve at least some of the heterogeneity 
of that fabric. You have a pretty diverse building fabric along the Highland, mix of industrial and some existing residential uses. And so that mix was something that they also, the city was intent on preserving um, and did that through zoning controls. They're set back. I mean, there are, there are rules about it, and it d depends. The heights change depending on where you are. So across from the historic district, they're lower. You know, when you get into to places on the avenues, which can receive more density, the height limits are higher. So it's all very contextually specific. Um, and, you know, it's governed by zoning. It's not really governed by the High Line. So the High Line is the High Line, and the city evolves around it. Peter, um, wasn't just two guys. It also was the design trust. Um, and I know, you know, we always have the issue as a nonprofit. Of, I was just talking to Teo about, you know, how do we in, bring theory and practice together? And how do we bring the bottom up and the top down together? I think a lot of nonprofit um, activity helps to make those dreams happen. Um, but my, my question relates back to the, the other woman's comment about um, not losing that pre those precious views. Mm. And a lot of folks are feeling that now, you know, that openness, that we're now getting that kind of canyon effect. And um, so, you know, how do you continue to be vigilant or model um, what the future development will bring? Yeah, so I'm glad you, you gave the design trust a shout out. Um, Susan. Sorry. No, 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 not at all. I mean, look, you know, I, I hope this came across. The, the stories that I'm telling were a little bit, you know, they're sort of, they're tropic, right? I mean, the, you know, the, and that's, they're, they're, it's, a, it's a little bit of about the myth, right? But the reality is, is that the design trust was one, was a critical aspect of the process in terms of generating support. And then as were many others, and actually, you know, the, 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 one of the ways this gets done is through the help of as many people as possible. Um, and the design trust was obviously a big part of that. Um, in terms of the zoning and the, the how do you make it, the, the city is gonna change. I mean, I've made my peace with this, even in Hudson Yards, right, where we have 90-story buildings, right? You know, the city is gonna change and, you know, there are limits to what any one entity can do. Certainly, you know, a nonprofit that's maintaining a public space. Um, and that to me is part of what is interesting about the experience of the High Line, is that you're watching the city transform itself in real time, right? And so, yeah, so one thing that comes up may not be that great, right? But in some total, the experience of all these things, all it does is it gives you an enhanced appreciation of the city and how it works and how it changes itself. And I think there will be an impact on how people perceive their own context, you know, when they leave the High Line as a result. So, you know, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm at peace with that. Last question here. Hi. Uh, thank you for the great presentation. Um, we've been talking a lot about, about um, the impact of tourism on sites yeah. today. And I <coughs> have been on the High Line before where yeah. it's been packed. Unbearable, <laughs> <And I> was, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I was just kind of wondering, has there been an impact, has there been a negative impact um, on the High Line from tourism? and on the other, on the flip side, has there been a positive impact from visitors coming? Do you get support from people who are coming to New York and experiencing right. the High Line? Um, there's definitely a negative impact. I mean, I, I don't. I'm a New Yorker. I don't hate tourists. I'm not afraid to admit it. Um, they are our guests in the city. Um, uh, but the numbers can be overwhelming sometimes, and that's not good for. A lot of things. It's hard on the maintenance of the structure. Um, it's definitely not good for the experience. You know, people. It's not that. It's not a great place to be when you can't walk, right? Because of the numbers of people. Um, so that's not a good thing. Um, the way that we are trying to address that is through having a filter that everything that we do as an organization, in terms of the operation and maintenance of the High Line, has to be seen through the the the, the lens of a New Yorker or a neighbor. Right, like are what we're doing good for neighbors and good for New Yorkers. So we're trying to help those constituents to the extent that we can 
It's one of the reasons why we're, we're spending a lot of resources on programming because the neighbors are the ones that actually make use of those and it, it helps them give them a way to engage the high line. Um, so look, it, this, is a, this is a challenge. I mean, the benefit of it is that it's tax revenue, right? I mean, it's good for the economy. And I was having a conversation the brunch, the lunch because you know, the Bloomberg legacy is obviously hotly debated right now. You, know, you have to remember where the city was in 2001 Right after 9/11, like there were questions about was the city going to make it, right? There, I mean, and nobody remembers that because we've come so far, right? And so, you know, obviously the tourism is a problem, but you know, it's economic development. Well, Peter, thank you for a fabulous talk. Our next speaker is John Oxendorf who um, is really known to all of us as somebody who has really changed our view about preservation engineering, and in particular structural engineering, uh, made it the, the site of a new type of creativity and, and a type of uh, rigor um, that was uh, something that was new in the field and in a way something that was already there but uh, had not been really thought about in the, in the way that, that he does. Um, he engages historic structures on, in their own terms, which is quite a radical point of view, whereas structural engineers uh, tended to try to uh, restructure the historic building. So quite, a, quite an interesting practice that has led him to, um, to do all sorts of amazing projects. Uh, he serves as the class of 1942 Professor of Engineering and Architecture at MIT and is the founding partner of the engineering firm Oxendorf, de Jong, and Bloch. He is the author of Guastavino Vaulting, The Art of Structural Tile, and is the recipient of numerous distinguished fe uh, fellowships, including the Rome Prize, from the American Academy in Rome and the MacArthur Genius Fellowships of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Um, today, his talk is entitled Structure. Please join me in welcoming John Oxendorf. Thank you so much, Jorge. It is a, a tremendous privilege to be here. I admire this school very much and, uh, and this program and I've often worked with, uh, with graduates of the program. I'm uh, sad that I never met Jim Fitch, but his career and his work have, have cast a long shadow over our work and have inspired many things that we do. So, uh, so it's, a, it's an honor to be here. <clears throat> My work in engineering and preservation really begins here in the vertical landscape in Peru where in bridging structural engineering and archaeology, uh, or trying to combine structural engineering and archaeology, I, I came enamored with uh, pre-Columbian works of engineering in South America. And in this vertical landscape uh, during the Inca period, an immense road network was built, which was stitched together over the deep canyons with long span suspension bridges. These bridges were longer than uh, any span in Europe at the time. And uh, when the conquistadors arrived, they were <clears throat> absolutely terrified of these bridges. Uh, their horses and cannons and armies crossed the bridges, but they crawled across them on their hands and knees. Uh, they called them the work of the devil. And, uh, and they were essentially a completely unknown technology in, in, a, in a realm where a bridge was stone on stone in compression following a Roman tradition. Miraculously, one of these bridges has survived until the present day. It exists in a remote area of what is now Peru, and it is a traditional Inca suspension bridge that is built entirely out of grass that grows on both sides of the canyon. And um, for those of you working in conservation, you ask how you get a grass bridge to last for 600 years. Um, there is no epoxy or any other treatment to the bridge. It is woven into the two communities on either sides of the canyon who gather once a year in a three-day festival. Each household collects grass. They braid uh, a cord about the size of your finger. 
They produce about 50 meters of cord per household, and then those are laid out in large bundles, strands of, of cord which are braided into a large cable in a traditional rope walk with uh, both villages uh, fully participating. The main structural cables are about the size of your thigh, and uh, six of those are used to, to rebuild the bridge every single year. So at the end of day one of the festival, there's an extraordinary pile of, of golden grass, and uh, the old bridge is cut, it drops into the canyon, is washed away, and um, yes, it is sustainable, it's 100% biodegradable, <laughs> renewable, and uh, the new cables are passed across and stretched uh, with four cables for the floor of the bridge and two for the handrails. And if you're thinking about crossing, at this point it's not quite ready, so there's a barrier. And um, <clears throat> so day two is uh, installing those six cables, and then day three comes down to the Chaka Kamayak, the bridge keeper. And this is Victoriano, whose family has been renewing this bridge for more than three centuries. And um, his job is quite difficult. He's braiding the handrails to the floor cables. Uh, but at this point, it's day three of the festival. Things are really heating up, and there are about 500 drunk people screaming at him, uh, hoping that he'll fall into the canyon. And um, <clears throat> I became involved in this, in studying this structure and other Inca bridges when Nova did a production on, on ancient technology. And this was the producer who had the immense honor of being the godfather of the bridge that year and was therefore the first to cross. And he, like the Spanish, was completely terrified. And he said, I'm a little worried that if I lean out on a cable, maybe it'll lean out into space. And if I grab the other cable, maybe it'll flip me over and dump me into the canyon. He said, does that ever happen? And one of the villagers said, oh yeah, that happens all the time. <laughs> and um, so this is a this is a lively structure. It, it bounces around quite a lot. I must say my mother was not thrilled that I was there uh, crossing it. And, um, and yet it's an absolutely remarkable work of technology. We've been working with the Smithsonian for about three years now uh, to bring Victoriano to the Folklife Festival on the Mall in Washington to replicate the bridge next year and then to install it in the rotunda of the, fo of the Museum of the American Indian for an exhibition on the Inca road system. And so... Um, and so for me, uh, the bridge <clears throat> means many things, but uh, if we were really starting to bring it to international prominence, and I simply want to point out the image that a new bridge was built uh, about 40 years ago by a development agency who came along and said, this is a substandard old rickety bridge, we need to replace it. So the, the grass bridge has been functionally obsolete as a spanning system for 40 years, but the festival had to go on. And the communities produced the bridge as a result of that three-day festival. Now, predictably, uh, the imported technology is failing and the steel is corroding and that bridge is collapsing, but the grass bridge continues to be produced. So uh, I tell you this as an anecdote to start because uh, when I was studying structural engineering and archaeology, I was really trying to bridge uh, what C.P. Snow termed the two cultures of the sciences and the humanities. And I think one of the great values of preservation is it's one of the really, uh, truly uh, interdisciplinary disciplines which, which spans the two cultures in a very profound way. And I think this school uh, perhaps exemplifies that uh, better than anywhere. Um, <clears throat> and Deciding that I would only study topics that could never lead to a job, uh, having done my undergraduate studies of this bridge, and, and frankly, um, being fairly ridiculed by engineering professors for studying such primitive, uninteresting structures, um, the archaeologists welcomed me with open, open arms, and it was very tempting to go to uh, graduate school in archaeology or preservation, but I decided uh, engineering, uh, we in these fields we needed more engineers with uh, historical perspectives and so I was very fortunate to go to Cambridge where I'll never forget when I arrived at Cambridge for my PhD and uh, to go study structural mechanics this is the first thing I'm confronted with I was at King's College this is my chapel um, and my chapel it's not my chapel it's King's <laughs> College Chapel it's 500 years old we've just published a volume on this uh, celebrating the 500 year uh, anniversary the vault was finished in 1515 
This is one of the highest achievements of English fan vaulting. And what was astonishing to me as an engineer is that this vault spans uh, about 42 feet. It's about four inches thick in stone. It has double curvature. Over the windows where the walls have leaned outward slightly, the walls have pulled away from the vault, which means when you're standing on top of the vault, there's a gap here running through stones. There's a, a large crack, which is four inches wide, and you can see down to the pavement below. And I've often given tours on top of this vault, and when you stand on top of the vault, <clears throat> you're supported 80 feet off of the pavement below, and you're on four inches of stone, and you think to yourself, the nerve of these people. <laughs> and, and frankly, they never took a course in, in nonlinear dynamics or finite element analysis, and no building code in the world would allow us to build this today. Uh, but fortunately, uh, the tradition in, Eng in England is to uh, treat such a building with a light touch, and uh, there's been virtually no intervention. The vault is, is remarkably intact, despite uh, these very large openings in the vault. So that was extremely stimulating for me arriving there, and, uh, and <clears throat> what I'd like to really talk about is from my own perspective of structural engineering, uh, what I see as some of the perils, but also some of the possibilities for preservation. And, Although I'll focus on structures, these same comments could apply to other disciplines around mechanical engineering or facade engineering or materials or many other aspects. Um, a few more anecdotes. This is a colonial arch bridge in Mexico that had survived wars and earthquakes and floods uh, and was carrying modern traffic for 400 years. And in the 1980s, an engineer with a master's degree in post-tensioned concrete bridges from MIT arrived and did a few quick calculations. He said, no, this isn't really gonna do. And he tore it down and he built a uh, post-tension concrete bridges. And so my colleagues in Mexico like to tell me that the bridge could survive the earthquakes and the floods, but it could not survive a master's degree from MIT. <laughs> and so we are working to uh, improve the value of a master's degree from MIT. Uh, but there are a few other, and these are just a handful of some of my favorite examples. The tile fell from this uh, Guastavino ceiling in what is now the uh, St. Louis Art Museum. And this is really a prototype for Ellis Island. In my mind, it's about 16 years before Ellis Island. A tile falls. Uh, this is com a common problem with Guastavino vaults. A tile can come loose and fall. Uh, war was declared on the vault, a steel fr uh, mesh was added, and it was gunited from below, so it's now encased in concrete and steel, and we'll probably never be able to uh, have this view again, uh, but at least the vault is still there. Um, we have other cases, uh, many cases of vaults being torn down because they weren't understood at the Met in the early 60s. Uh, engineers were scratching their heads and decided the vaults wouldn't do, so uh, they tore them down and, and, and installed a steel beam floor system instead. And uh, for me, this is a, a terrible example of um, not meeting the triple bottom line. So this is a great economic cost to the Met, but it's also loss of, of cultural artifacts and, uh, and also environmental impact. Um, well, the Guastavino company knew how to prove that their vaults had capacity. They would put 100,000 pounds of lead on top of uh, an arch and demonstrate, and that was good enough for the New York, um, uh, the uh, building uh, administration who, who uh, approved their vaults. But then another more recent example uh, that I learned about when I arrived, I was fortunate enough to arrive in Rome where I was under the uh, stewardship of some of your graduates who took very good care of me in Rome, and I learned that the Great Hall of Trajan's Market, which had been there for 2,000 years, was in the process of having steel cables inserted in both directions throughout the vault. And the more I looked into this, I learned that it was on the basis of a single engineer who said the vault is unsafe. And um, as I tell my students today, if the structure's been there for 100 years, never mind 2,000, and your calculation says the structure does not stand up, it is not the structure that is wrong. <laughs> Right? So we're really trying to emphasize, uh, let's say, empathy. <laughs> um, and so <clears throat> I would like to try to remove the steel from this vault before I die. But the main thing I want to point out is that this solution was done with no debate, with no peer review, 
An engineer comes up with one solution, not a spectrum of solutions, not a peer review. If I personally were asked to, to touch a 2,000-year-old vault, I would want to invite five of the best engineers I know and many of the people in this room to come around a table and to debate what could be done if something needed to be done rather than a unilateral decision. And so this for me is, is perhaps the hallmark of, of preservation engineering. Um, it's also true that because something's been there for a while, it won't be there forever. And uh, the Basilica of St. Francis in Assisi with uh, priceless frescoes is a, a classical example of that where the earthquake in 1997 tragically destroyed the vaults and, and some of the frescoes. And, um, and this, was, this was unexpected. It was a tremendous loss of, of, of cultural heritage. Um, Adam and his team had not been there to document, and, um, and people lost their lives. It damaged the economy. We had a recent master's thesis study this and found that the basilica and its vault had withstood larger earthquakes closer to the site for six centuries. But then in the 1970s, the original wooden roof had been removed and a reinforced concrete roof, which changed the mass and the stiffness of the building completely, uh, helped provoke this. Now, again, let's debate whether an intervention is, is uh, needed or not. So when an engineer walks into a historical structure, there are some drivers to intervene. And the first one is the responsibility or the fear. You know, that as an engineer, if heaven forbid a building collapses and, and 30 school children were to die, you know, you're responsible for that. And so this is a, is a strong motivator and, um, and yet it needs to be balanced, um, particularly in the case of a structure that's been there for a while. The second one, which is less forgivable, is ignorance. And you know, if you look at the curriculum of structural engineering, and I'm picking on my own field, but I think it's true of many other disciplines as well, we treat every project as a completely new structure. And there are two materials, steel and reinforced concrete. And there are no classes in structural engineering on existing buildings in most universities around the world, and, and particularly here in the US. And the reality, of course, is then you go out in the field, and the first 10 jobs you work on could all be existing buildings. And much of the spending uh, on new construction or on construction projects is on existing buildings. Um, so. <clears throat> although there's not as much study. And, and so I guess the main point I want to make is that engineers can learn about historic structures through uh, t studying art history, coming to preservation school, or practicing. Uh, there aren't many places where you can study engineering and really uh, go into depth. And then the third driver to intervene, which is slightly vulgar to point it out, but it's absolutely true, is money. If you are motivated and your pay is a portion of the scale of the project, you're unlikely to walk into a structure and say, yeah, it looks pretty good. Here's my report. It's two pages and um, you, know, you don't need to pay me very much. It's far easier to, to call five or ten of your closest friends who are all different subcontractors who can help do a big intervention. And so, so I think we have to take an honest look at the driver, the financial incentives to intervene, which in many cases go against the interest of a structure. So <clears throat> the rest of my talk, I'm going to try to be more positive. <laughs> what are some possibilities? This is a 250-year-old bridge in England that was studied. A team of engineers came along. They did a lot of careful analysis. They stepped back, and they said, the bridge is fine. They didn't touch it. They did no works on the bridge. And the Institution of Civil Engineers thought it was so noteworthy that it was studied and not touched that they gave them an award <laughs> for doing nothing. So, so this is my kind of engineering commendation, right? Let's, <laughs> let's let the, the merit of your work be measured by the uh, lightness of your touch. And especially when we're thinking in terms of centuries, this is fundamental. Um, so <clears throat> a few guidelines for us. And uh, number one, I think, be humble. The builders knew uh, certainly at least as much as we know and probably a lot more. Uh, if we think about building a stone vault, for example, uh, very few people alive have the experience of having built a stone vault and certainly not something as complex as, as King's College Chapel. Um, we assume that the structure is safe if it's already been there and then we try to prove it. And we're not always able to prove that it's safe or that the margins of safety are what we want. Um, but we start with the assumption that it's okay. Uh, and I think oftentimes entering in historic structures there's a prejudice that 
something's wrong and something must be done. Uh, <clears throat> for those of you who are cynical about going to doctors, you could say, don't go to the doctor because they'll find something wrong with you. Um, and then the third thing is that we, we really don't work on our own as engineers. We, we really enjoy and love working with historians and preservationists and, and designers and people from many different backgrounds, anthropologists. And we also promote a debating a range of solutions. And the notion that any problem in, when engineering is applied to it will have a single answer, I think, is... Uh, both too maybe reductivist, but also the, uh, too deterministic and that engineering has, has one answer, which we certainly know it doesn't. So <clears throat> at Cambridge, I was fortunate to work with Jacques Hyman, who was um, chief engineer for many of the leading Gothic cathedrals in England, and he's published this lovely little book called Stone Skeleton, which I highly recommend. And he basically says, if you have a structure made of masonry, uh, the stability is what determines the safety rather than the strength of the material because the stresses are very low and these structures stand in compression. And many of you know this idea from the notion of Gaudí's hanging chain, uh, which is actually Robert Hooke's hanging chain about 200 years earlier, and, but Gaudí implemented it in practice, which if inverted gives you a line of force that lies within the structure. And we can, we can solve for those forces using uh, graphic statics, which is a marvelous 19th century method that allow you in, in real time to explore a range of solutions. All the ones that lie within the stone arch here are valid solutions. And um, I know it's Saturday afternoon and you all have better things to do, but welcome to structures class. <laughs> um, and of course, I should say also that graphic statics is the design method of choice used by the greatest structural designers in history from Eiffel to Nervi to Maillard uh, to practitioners today. And ironically, if you take the tools on the desktop of, of every structural engineer uh, in the country today, and in particular finite element analysis, and you look at two arches where one is twice as thick as the other, the tool basically is not appropriate. It can't tell you anything about these two arches, uh, but Hook's hanging chain tells you immediately that the arch on the left is too thin to stand up, and the arch on the right is capable of standing up and supporting a lot more load. So um, you could hardly have a more clear indictment of a method than that, but the colors are really, really pretty. Um, and it looks a lot better on the cover of a report than, than this simple thrust line analysis, but the thrust line is much more valuable for us. So here are a couple of examples. Selby Abbey, where when a tower was added, it punched through the foundations and caused a differential settlement of one meter within this historical abbey. So imagine 800 years ago, there's a differential settlement of one meter. The arches are deformed, and the mortar's a lime mortar, which happily uh, adjusts. And we can prove that this deformed arch, despite the fact that it's been there for 800 years, that gives us some validation of safety, even though it looks rather alarming. Um, but we can prove that it works because uh, we can move the supports around through the centuries and we can find stable thrust lines that lie within the arch. So arches can dance throughout the centuries. They don't need to have steel in them. And, um, and that gives them the, uh, the redundancy as well as the durability that we see in traditional unreinforced masonry. Um, I must say I've been hugely uh, fortunate to work with faculty at Columbia, um, particularly Stephen Murray in art history with his Mellon-funded program to go to, the, to central France, and some preservation students went on that as well where we documented about 100 Romanesque churches and studied the stability conditions and found a failure rate of something like 5 in 100 on a thousand year time scale, which we took to be a pretty successful design rate. Um, and he also influenced us to think about um, what we could do when we have geometry of buildings and how we could use that to better understand the stability of buildings. We're still uh, working with that and now not just doing numerical calculations but also physical simulations. This is Bourges Cathedral 3D printed at 1 to 50 scale and then we can do collapse analyses of the flying buttresses at Bourges um, partly because it's fun and partly because <laughs> nobody's ever done a collapse analysis of flying buttresses before. Um, and then we can extend that to more complex 3D structures. So this is a dome that's 3D printed 
And if we tilt it, we simulate an earthquake being applied to it, and then we can understand the collapse modes of historical masonry domes, uh, even if they have large cracks in them. Uh, like the Pantheon, which uh, is not um, widely known, but when the cracks were last exposed in the 1930s, here you see on the right, some of them are about a foot wide. And they're radial, they radiate all around the Pantheon, and uh, the walls lean outward, the cracks open, and they're completely safe. Um, and we are sharpening our tools, preparing for the day when someone says the Pantheon is not safe and we need to install steel. Uh, we want to be prepared to understand um, or to be able to quantify what it would take to make it fall down. And so we had two students in Rome this summer building a 3D model and 3D printing uh, the Pantheon now, and we'll be doing collapse experiments on that in the next couple months. Um, I can preview the results. This structure is stable. Um, and then a real frontier for us is in earthquake uh, performance. And so trying to understand um, the safety of historical structures and earthquakes uh, with traditional materials and trying to understand what it would take to make them fail. Um, and just a little bit about, about practice. We have been working, uh, our, our small uh, consulting company is made up of three academics. And so because we're academics, we have health insurance and a salary, so we're a little bit lazy about going after work, but, but we've been able to, to work on projects selectively that we find exciting or interesting, and so this was a cavate wall, a Native American wall that was suffering erosion, and so working backward from laser scan, we built a numerical model to try to understand how much more erosion uh, would be required. This was for the Park Service, and, um, and this was more or less not a study to do an intervention, but a study to understand maybe how many years left we would have if, if uh, things were left as is. And we've also been developing uh, three-dimensional analysis tools to prove that complex vault geometries like King's College Chapel uh, can be in equilibrium even with large cracks over the windows. And um, I wanted to share an anecdote with, with, from my time in Rome where uh, in the marvelous meals at the American Academy at this table, uh, one of your graduates was concerned about the stability of the vaults overhead and some small cracks that had appeared. And I said, you know, <clears throat> if we could have a, take a lightsaber and we could cut through the vault in two places and we could take a half of the vault, I think we could show that that would be stable and then the whole structure would be stable. And they were kind enough to give me a large studio to test the idea. So we built the half vault uh, in the studio, and, and the art historians were the ones who were most excited to handle bricks, um, which was fun. And you see this vault is incredibly thin. It's one inch thick, it's one layer of brick. This is the Italian variation on the Guastavino vault that uh, went from, at St. Paul's Chapel, it's two layers in places, other, mostly in New York, it's three or four layers of tile. All over Italy, there are one tile thick vaults and uh, these are remarkable structures um, that stand because of their geometry, because of the double curvature, uh, that have pretty remarkable load capacity. This is a piece I call two bald guys and a hairy guy. <laughs> and this is um, <clears throat> four chefs and an engineer. <laughs> and um, the highest compliment paid for this vault was that the night security watchman liked to make a bed and sleep under it. And uh, he felt very safe and comfortable under it. And I just want to make a side comment that the history of construction technology is a field that needs much more attention because it's falling between the cracks of different disciplines. So uh, Corb is using this as a permanent formwork in the Maison Jaoul, but a recent book on this project completely accepts that the vault, calls it a Catalan vault, uh, with no critical investigation of the history of the technique or, or how it came into Corb's work. And so um, I've been very active in a series of international congresses on construction history. Our next one will be in Chicago in June, and I, I know I will see some of you there, and I just want to emphasize that we think this is a discipline in its own right where people can come together from many different fields, including preservation, and can talk about details of construction throughout history um, and, and can learn from each other because it really does, um, does fall between disciplines. And here's Choisy pointing out the Roman tradition of using ceramic tiles um, as lost formwork. 
So <clears throat> I have to say a couple of words about Guastavino and these marvelous plastic structures and thin brick and ceramic, which are so intimately linked to Colombia uh, because of George Collins uh, having the archive moved here, but also because of uh, this program and all the work done here and all of you in the room who've worked on Guastavino over the years. Another load test on a stair. Um, We've been developing methods to try to prove that the stairs stand up uh, in compression. And uh, this miraculous stair at Carnegie Mellon is 100 years old this year. And I got a call this week that they're going to put a plaque on the wall highlighting uh, it as a, as a marvelous structure by Guastavino. So we're really trying to, um, to help continue to expand and protect their work uh, and maybe think about other potential futures. This is the first, city, the first underground subway station in New York, which has been closed for 60 years. And I just have to highlight uh, St. John the Divine, which was where the dome was built by the sun, Guastavino Jr., in only 14 weeks with the masons supported on the bricks that they laid the day before. And uh, similar to Brunelleschi's dome in Florence, uh, no formwork from below. Uh, it was a temporary structure. It's now been there for a century. And um, if we look at the thinness of St. John the Divine compared to the great domes in history, it's truly miraculous. It's a, it's a thin shell structure decades before thin shell concrete were, was built at this scale in this country. And, um, and of course, many of these great works, which were by the son and not by the father, are now celebrating their centennial, like Grand Central, which has just uh, been recently renewed. And for me, Ellis Island, I think, is a, both a marvelous success story, but also highlights how far we have to go because the last time I was there, the plaque here said the ceiling was built by the Gustavino brothers. And um, <clears throat> it was, of course, Guastavino. And the father had died a decade earlier. It was built by the son. Um, and I'd, I'd like to think that um, when Jim Fitch put this on the cover of his book, that there was a recognition that this project embodied so many things that were good about uh, preservation and about uh, the power of preservation. We recently concluded a, several years of work on a public exhibition, which was here in New York. It just closed at the Museum of the City of New York. We had to come to New York last because you guys kind of steal all the thunder. We couldn't come here first. No one else would have covered us. And uh, we had a tremendous response in Boston, Washington, and New York. We, we published a new guide to Guastavino in New York. Uh, there are nearly 300 projects in the five boroughs that are still extant, and we're finding projects all the time. Uh, I have a long-standing offer to invite you to lunch if you find a project that I don't know about it or is not on our list. Um, so that is, uh, I have hungry graduate students all over the world scouring their <laughs> neighborhoods. And, um, and what was particularly satisfying about this show was that about 100,000 people saw it, so we really worked to bring the story to the public. But for me, the fact that we brought traditional craftsmen and masons together with students to build a vault in each venue and we learned each time we built the vault, and that was very valuable. And um, so just in, in closing aspects of preservation, I think there's a lot more opportunities. There's going to be a great deal of, of spending on existing structures, and there's a demand for preservation engineers, so that's a positive thing. I also find great interest among students, you know, if you have the choice between designing uh, steel connections on new buildings all day long or going out and climbing all over old buildings. Climbing on old buildings is a lot more fun. And, um, and there are a lot of areas of open research. So we have a group uh, which is, has a focus on masonry and all of our design classes include a lot of historical content. Um, and we're also teaching an advanced seminar on uh, analysis of structures, trying to continue to learn and uh, improve our analysis methods. And, um, and that has been uh, very satisfying over the last 13 years as we've built that up at MIT. Uh, but I just want to close with the last few minutes in sharing uh, something that's completely unexpected for me that came out of this body of work that I've shared, and that is relevance to design and to design in the future. So this is the first graphic statics calculation that we know of by the Guastavino Company here for St. Paul's Chapel. It was not by Guastavino, it was by a consulting engineer named Nelson Goodyear, but I think that prompted Guastavino Jr. to learn graphic statics and to then begin using it to design structures. And um, 
if we look at contemporary structures, this is a, a project that I visited on five occasions. I photographed it, I studied it, I sketched it. I could not understand how this structure stood up and uh, if Raphael had been there with me, Junior in particular, he also would have struggled to find a load path that worked. And then one day on the news, I learned it does not stand up. <laughs> and this is Charles de Gaulle Airport, which is a 1 billion euro failure. And it, for me, it represents a disconnect between uh, form and geometry and design and structure and that um, one of the things that's so beautiful about traditional masonry and about what we can learn from it in that marvelous chapel at King's at Cambridge is that there's no separation between the structure, the geometry, and the material, and, um, and it, it simply must work. There's no trickery. There's, there's nothing uh, else holding it together than stone abutting against stone. And so uh, just a couple of design projects where we've used this. We're working very hard right now on this memorial to be built in stone. Uh, with a colleague, Mi Jin Yoon, in architecture, and we're using these traditional methods to show that the stone is, structure is stable, uh, as well as newer methods that we've developed. And uh, this is to be built with 32 stones weighing five to 10 tons each, each made of granite. And for five months, every single meeting that we've had, the engineers we've been collaborating with have proposed adding post-tensioning cables in every single meeting for five months. Uh, to the point now where I get a kind of twitch in the side of my face when it's talked about. Um, but there's a, daily, uh, there's a daily challenge to show that it can work with, uh, with no steel. And um, you know, I'm a full professor at MIT. I have a PhD in masonry mechanics. I, I should be able to demonstrate that this works with no steel, and, um, and yet I'm struggling. So, um, and so that's a, a challenge, but also it shows that uh, there are possibilities in contemporary architecture as well as ways that there can be a dialogue between uh, traditional constructions and new constructions. And then uh, we've done similar things with Guastavino systems. This is a project in England where the client wanted a 500 year design life. We brought masons from Spain to train English masons and we built two long span domes uh, with natural light, natural ventilation, no steel, um, rammed earth walls, 80% lower embodied uh, carbon uh, by using local materials and local labor. And, um, and I think a humble project, but now operating as a net zero energy building and directly informed by our research and history. And we were, this really pushed our calculation abilities to their limit. And then we found a Guastavino vault on the campus of Yale that's a longer span and half the rise is our dome. So essentially twice as daring as what we were able to do. And um, so that says there are many more geometries out there waiting to be discovered. Uh, I also hope Yale never calls me to assess this vault because it's absolutely miraculous. Um, and it, it lets us know that we are still not at what uh, Guastavino Jr. was able to safely achieve a century ago. And then the final project as a result of that, we collaborated with a uh, South African architect, Peter Rich, in a remote area where, again, the emphasis was local materials, local labor. We developed a brick formulation made of compressed earth and then trained masons to build arches and vaults and uh, designed them with no steel, so getting the geometry so that they worked with no steel and built a series of vaults, domes, and uh, this is a World Heritage Site with a... Um, a visitor center which was meant to be a catalyst for economic development in the area and to employ local people. And uh, this is the finished building. And to our huge surprise in 2009, out of 700 global projects, this one world building of the year. And so uh, that for us uh, really shows the potential of using traditional materials in, in innovative ways. And I'll just leave you with three thoughts, um, Jorge, asked me to, uh, to speculate about where things may go in the coming 50 years. And the first news I'd like to share is that counting on medical advances, I look forward to seeing all of you here in 50 years. <laughs> and um, and uh, the first thing I think is we need to develop and implement robust training and preservation and engineering in particular. And that isn't just structure, but it's, and it's not just in universities, but it's also in practice. So in England, there's a new certification system for engineers who are certified to work in cultural heritage who have to go through a series of, of training. And so, um, 
And so I think that's something we could aspire to, to try to do together. Um, the second thing is I think we need to demonstrate the value of, of this discipline for allied disciplines. And certainly for me, it's been satisfying that in looking to the past, our work and our ideas kind of spill over into the future into contemporary design projects. And um, so I think there's a richness there that uh, can have an impact and can ask, you know, what can we give back to, to other disciplines uh, uh, from, from preservation? And then finally, I would say we need to work a lot harder at quantifying the triple bottom line of social benefit as well as economic and environmental benefit. And, um, and I think we need to become, I'm an engineer, so of course I'm going to ask for us to be quantitative, but I think that will really will help us win the arguments for policymakers uh, and for designers across the board as we think about uh, how, to, how to care for the built environment in the, in the decades to come. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was a very illustrating and stimulating um, uh, presentation, and I think MIT has come a long way since I was there in the 1990s when historic preservation was not on the agenda. I think um, I was struggling with that back then. So it's I didn't good. say it was on the agenda, but oh, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I, okay. we're, try we're trying. <laughs> It's, it's really, really inspiring to see that that's happening. So that's really good. I think um, in terms of um, materials, I was wondering if you have given some thought to, um, I mean, you know, traditional materials are very, very uh, important in terms of their um, strength and durability and longevity. Um, one of the things about bricks and these materials that were created was that when they are created, they are taking up a lot of energy. There is a whole uh, mess of building materials that were used as uh, materials that are growing, like wood or coral, the sea, st uh, sea stone. So is it possible to even envision learning from traditional building materials that are uh, biologically produced to start inventing biologically produced materials that are less energy um, consuming when they are made. Yeah, so it's certainly possible, and we're doing some work in that area. I would say that's a little more um, for uh, design and for projects and for new construction. And so we have quite a bit of work looking at alternative materials for masonry, from waste products, and more environmentally uh, benign manufacturing methods. Um, there's absolutely a global imperative for that. Uh, and yet, in caring for existing buildings and traditional structures, I'm adamant that it isn't only the authenticity of the traditional material, but also the technique. Mm -hmm. And so, when the pinnacles of King's College Chapel wear out every 200 years, what they go to the same quarry and they carve new pinnacles with the same methods. In the old molten pinnacle, they can carve into uh, little uh, desk paperweights, which they can sell in the gift shop. And that's a very, <laughs> so that, that to me is, is authenticity. Um, so, so absolutely, but I think it's more for new design rather than for maintaining existing stock, particularly if it's of cultural value. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, uh, just uh, to build on that, I think the buildings that are built by coral sandstone, let's take that as an example, when they are restored, in a large part of the world, especially in the Persian Gulf right now, because there is money to do such restoration, a lot of um, the times coral is actually harvested to restore the buildings. So I think that there is a viability to really start thinking of materials for restoration that are growing as well, so that they can be restored in a way that uh, potentially can stop the devastation of the coral reef for the purpose of uh, restoration. Yeah, so, so I agree with that. I think it is what you're suggesting is really in the field of material science, yeah. which is not so much my field, but I do work with material scientists in, in those areas. So um, yes, stay tuned. There should be better Great. materials with lower coming CO2 out. in the coming decades. I was in the wrong time <clears throat> at the right place.
I stand between all of you and coffee. I am very happy to, to converse individually if you like. Um, Other questions before we break? Maybe I wasn't provocative enough. I'll try to be more, <laughs> I'll try to be more provocative. Hi. Um, so as you said, earthquakes are like one of the um, reasons that historical um, structures deteriorate and, uh, de and are destroyed. Um, do you have any opinion or have you used um, base isolation in order to leave the structures uh, on their own and, and all the structural um, stress would be like? Yeah. Um, um, so, so yes, base isolation is a, is a, is a good strategy. Uh, it has the major downside that it's incredibly expensive because you pick the whole structure up and basically isolate it on, on bearings. And so I think in certain cases where there's a monument of particular importance in a high seismic zone, it makes sense, but, um, but the basic problem with it is cost. And our real challenge is um, in knowing, it's twofold, it's one, knowing which structures are at danger of collapse in, in a seismic event. And then the second thing is knowing that our interventions are going to make it better and not worse. And unfortunately, the state of knowledge of the dynamic response of traditional masonry buildings is so premature right now, we are in our infancy. And so a lot of interventions, and I think you know, there's a lot of experience in places like Italy where earthquakes occur, and they look back at all the interventions of the 70s and 80s and they think, my God, we put concrete slabs in all these buildings and that added mass and it was a driving force and suddenly buildings are collapsing. They say, okay, no more big concrete slabs or let's make sure we tie it together. And so, um, so there's, there's experience, but we are in our infancy. We have a long way to go as the Basilica in Assisi shows. Thank you. Um, um, going back to the local people and their uh, respect for their culture and their sacrifice, um, I noticed these ancient churches in areas um, and top of mountains where the whole village had been destroyed, but the uh, church, the monastery survived. Uh, I am our, a religious person as well. Uh, and, <laughs> you know, aside from... <laughs> you know, God's help, whatever. And I was wondering, and they said, and these are built on top of hills where it's very hard to get to. And it turns out that uh, back in the day, uh, the people uh, would just give honey and uh, eggs. They would just not, they would cut from their own, uh, you know, these, these were poor people, but they would donate so that that mixture was used to hold these stones together. So and, is and that the mortar? Is Norman Weiss in the room? And um, isn't that, I mean, and so, I was laughing at the yeah. time, but. So from, from an engineering standpoint. <laughs> is, there any, the, is there any sense? <laughs> I appreciate the anecdote, but the, the stability of, of traditional masonry buildings really depends on their geometry. And of course, the stone cutting is amazing. That is but, important, right. but the stickiness of the mortar and its honey content is not yet. <laughs> Not yet a factor. <laughs> and they, they attribute that to, uh, you know, just, <laughs> but, uh, it, it, you know, that did they you, did I that missed the beginning. Years. Did you say Armenia? Yeah. Okay, I didn't hear that. So, so when I'm there, I will look for this. Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, it, it's, it's a really incredible lesson that you've given us, and also about the recovery of knowledge and how every, with every recovery, there is also a great deal of creativity and an expansion of our various fields. So in that sense, you know, we also have to be, be worried about what, what we lose when we, uh, when we invent new pedagogies and, and how much has been lost already in, in the process of, of thinking about architecture, structures in a very reductive way according to the most available materials, concrete and steel. So it's really wonderful to have you spearheading this, this complete revival of the discipline of structural engineering. So thank you very, very much. Kind. Thank you. And we have coffee waiting for you outside. If you would please return at 4.15.
we would be very grateful. did a number on the House and Senate chamber ceilings are terrible now. They totally redid them. Do you think they should have done that? All right. Oh, I'm always happy to learn, and I would say I'm not really I'll send you a little something about it, but no, that's great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Roz. 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 Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry that I didn't have a hybrid. I should have. I should have. Well, first of all, if you're... Think of it. Okay, it's all right. Uh, okay, 
That'd be great. Thank you, Ross. Nice to see you. It was good working with your team. Yeah, we're